This is Research Like a Pro, episode 30, Put It in a Table. Welcome to Research Like a Pro, a genealogy podcast about taking your research to the next level, hosted by Nicole Dyer and Diana Elder, accredited genealogy professional. Diana and Nicole are the mother-daughter team at FamilyLocket.com and the creators of the Amazon best-selling book, Research Like a Pro, a Genealogist Guide. I'm Nicole, co-host of the podcast. Join Diana and me as we discuss how to stay organized, make progress in our research, and solve difficult cases. Let's go. Hi, everyone. and Welcome to the show. I'm Nicole Dyer, co-host of Research Like a Pro. I'm here with accredited genealogist, my mother, Diana Elder. Today, we are talking about putting our information into tables as we write reports. Hi, Diana. How are you doing? I'm doing great today. It's so fun to have a day to just stay home. Last week, I was up in Salt Lake City every day doing SLIG, which is short for the Salt Lake Institute of Genealogy. And I had to get up really early and commute up there and then come home later at night. So I really like my commute just upstairs to my office, staying at home this week. It's been awesome. Yeah. (laughs) But SLIG, let me just tell you and everybody listening, what a great opportunity it is to go to an institute. You have five days all day and you're immersed in a subject. So there were a lot this time at SLIG that I wanted to take. There was an African-American course, a Native American, two DNA courses, you know, multiple things that I would have loved. But I settled on Advanced Southern with Mark Lowe. And I'm so glad I did because I just learned a lot of new record types, just the stuff that you don't really get to in regular genealogy. It's when you're really digging deep. So it was super fun. I had a great week. And next year you need to come with me, Nicole. I want to. I'm so excited because I signed up for the very first ever virtual course that SLIG is putting on. It's called Intermediate Foundations, and it's beginning actually in two weeks. So I'm really looking forward to that. It's going to be taught by Sarah Scribner, who's a certified genealogist. And there are several guest teachers as well, including, I think, the legal genealogist, Judy Russell, and a few others. So I'm excited. It's every Tuesday night. That's going to be really great. I love the idea of just continually learning and learning from other people. As we know, every time you do a project, you learn something new. And so when we learn from other people, they have different research experience than us, and we can glean all of their experience as well. So I just have to tell everybody and you just one exciting thing that I discovered this morning and on my own personal family history research, I'm doing the 14-day mini Research Like a Pro Challenge with several hundred other people who have signed up for that. And I chose an ancestor. She's my second great grandmother, Nancy Elizabeth Briscoe Frazier, because I hadn't researched her for years. And I thought it would be fun to try the process on somebody I hadn't looked at for a while. Well, in less than an hour of doing my timeline analysis, I found that I had added as a source or a hint on my ancestry tree for her a pension index card from Oklahoma, a widow's pension. And I hadn't known when I added it that you could actually go look at the pension. And those are now digitized. So in just about 30 seconds, I had found that pension and started reading the 10 pages of it. And it had just a few informational things that I didn't know, like her marriage date, her birth date, and the county she was born in. Just a few. (laughs) Where her husband served in the Confederacy. Yeah, I'm reading it with my mouth dropping thinking, oh my word, when we think we know everything about our ancestor, we need to rethink that because there's going to be something else out there that will put it all into focus and change your assumptions. This changed a bunch of my assumptions about her. Such a fun morning. (laughs) Great. I love those discoveries. It's so fun to be researching your own family sometimes too, after doing all the client projects. Oh yeah. Well, we just have to say thank you to all of our listeners for signing up to the 14-day mini challenge. It's been so fun. Over 300 of you have signed up to do the email challenge, and there's over 180 people in the Facebook group, and you can still join that. When this airs, it will be the very end of the challenge, but we will continue to keep the Facebook group open for anybody who wants to try doing the 14-day challenge with all the tasks in there so that you can see what to do each day. And you can sign up with friends and whatever and continue doing your research. 
So thanks everybody for joining us. And it has been so fun seeing all of your research questions, your objectives. And on the day that we're recording this, it's the third day of the challenge and everyone's doing their timeline analysis. So it has been really fun and I'm excited to see what everyone learns throughout the process. And holy cow, there are a lot of cool ideas out there about how to do your timeline and really neat photos that have been shared. So we love it. All right. We also want to mention that today, the 4th, and tomorrow, the 5th, are the last two days for our e-course sale. So it's on sale for $99. And the ebook, Research Like a Pro, is also on sale for the next two days for $4.99, which is half off the regular price. So we hope that you will purchase that if you've been thinking about getting it while it's on sale. And also the e-course, if you want to extend your learning to a more structured environment where you watch the webinars and take the quizzes and share your research in the dedicated Facebook group for the e-course and get more feedback, then we encourage you to sign up for that and let us know if you have any questions. All right, let's move forward with today's podcast. We have a review from Nancy in Illinois. She says, I agree with everything previous reviewers have said. I especially appreciate that while the tone is warm and friendly, the information is still presented efficiently. I listened to another podcast recently on another topic where the two podcasters kitchen conversation style included a lot of idle chit chat that made it very inefficient to find the meat. I also appreciate that they have no advertisements. They give honest feedback about the products they use, but don't hawk them. And then Nancy had a question. Diana mentioned that she files electronic records under the person the record pertains to. Since a census page will likely list more than one person in a household, does she duplicate that file in each individual person's directory or file it only under the head of household or have some other method to make additional household member census information available? That is a great question that we have talked about before. And one thing that you can do is copy that file and put it in all the different folders if you're doing your electronic filing. But if you're using Google Drive and having that backup and sync to your computer, a great tip that I learned that you can do is to put that one file without copying it into several different file locations across your Google Drive. And one way that you can do that is by pressing Shift Z when you're on the file, and then it'll ask you where you want to put that file, and you can have it in multiple locations. So it's kind of showing all these different file folders that point to the same document. And that can be nice if you're trying to save space in your Google Drive so that you don't go over the required amount or if you just don't want to have a bajillion copies of the same census image. Diana, what do you do about that? I want to try your control Z and Google Drive because I haven't done that. I have just been copying and putting the census into the different household members. But I do also put things into Evernote because I like the way Evernote lets me tag things. So I have discovered in my Google Drive that if I right click on, say, that census image, and then I go to send to, I can send it directly to Evernote. And I have to be in Evernote on the correct notebook. So if it's in, say, my Schultz notebook, it shows up right there in Evernote in my Schultz notebook. And then I can tag it with the surname and the location, the year of the census. And then when I'm doing maybe a kind of a locality search for all the people that surname in an area, I can find it. I could also tag it with the names of people in it. I keep everything in Google Drive, but then I also like to put it into Evernote because sometimes I want to search for things in a little bit different way and it gives me that capability. Good to know. You should try Google Drive because it's not Control-Z because that's undo. It's Shift-Z. So you have to be looking at the list of all of the files in a folder and select that one file and then you can say Shift-Z and then a little thing pops open, a little box and it says add here. And so you just select where you want to add it to. Nice. Did you learn about this from a YouTube video or how did you find out? No, I was just reading in the Google support forum when I was not even the forum, but just the Google articles about how to use Google Drive. It's just their support area because I'm creating my presentation for Roots Tech. And my presentation at Roots Tech is all about 
organizing your files with Google Drive. And so I was really excited when I saw that feature because I knew it would apply to us genealogists so well because we have all of these documents that we want to put in all of our different folders that apply to different people. Like when you write a report about a family and you want to put it in each of their folder, you can just add it to each folder without having to make copies of it. I love that. In our show notes for today, could you put maybe just a little tutorial on that for everybody listening? Because if they're like me, they're going, okay, I kind of get that, but I need to have it written down or be able to see it better. Yeah. I'm sure you could just put that in like three little bullet points for us and then we can go try it because I really do want to do that. I love the idea of simplifying, making it easy, but then also being super efficient. I bet there's a YouTube video that someone has made. So I'll try to find that or I'll at least put the link to the article of how to do it from Google. That would be perfect because I'm having a bad tech day today. And so I know I will not remember that. (laughs) All right. Well, talking about tech, we're going to talk about tech today and how to use our great tools to help us research better. And that is using the tool to create a table in our word processing databases. Tables are one of my very favorite things because it helps me make those connections. It helps me look at my data in a different way. And there have been client projects that I have not been able to crack until I put the information into a table. And then all of a sudden, the answer to the problem is just staring at me, but I had to get it in a way that I could look at that information differently. So today we're going to talk all about tables and some of the tables that we like to use and some of our tips and give everyone listening some ideas about how you could use a table in your research. I use tables in every research report because I know if it's going to help me understand the information, it's certainly going to help my client or anyone reading it understand the information. Plus, there's nothing more dry than reading a research report that's just paragraph after paragraph after paragraph of narrative. Having some tables breaks that up. It gives our eyes a break, and it really is more efficient in in showing the data. Some of the things that we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about how to use it to analyze your evidence, how to show the census information, and then how to use it for other types of records, and just give you some ideas about how we've been doing it. Well, just to give you an example that I want to talk about today, I talk a lot about my search for Cynthia Dillard Royston and her father. I've done several projects on this, and I have really narrowed it down to probably this George W. Dillard, who is her father. And I decided that in the last, it was a study group project, I decided I was going to really revisit that and track down every single thing I could find for that connection. And it was really key for me to figure out when Cynthia was born, because I was going to go looking for her in the 1820 census. And I I needed to know a pretty good birth year estimation. Well, as we all know, the census is notorious for giving us a wide range of not only birthplaces, but birth years. And Cynthia is one of those women that just got younger and younger. In 1850, she was 35. And then in 1860, she should have been 45, but she was 44. Then 1870, she was 53. And then by 1880, she was 62. Every 10 years, she lost a year of her life. And I love that because I would I'd be so young right now if I could do that. Anyway... I knew that things weren't really adding up, and I just decided to put that on a table. The first column has her name as it's written in the census, which is another interesting thing because Cynthia is spelled with an S, with a C. Sometimes she's Cynthia, you know, lots of different variations on that name. So I put her name just as it is. I put the census year, I had the source citation, you know, added as a footnote, where her residence is, her age, and then I make it easy on myself and I put her estimated birth year and her birthplace. So the range of her birth year wasn't as bad as some. Sometimes I've seen birth years that are really wide range. Hers was 1815 to 1818. So that gave me a pretty good estimation. And I I settled on 1815 because it was the earliest. It was 1850. She was 35 years old. I figured that was probably the closest to the correct date. So anyway, I have since used that technique in a lot of client projects. In fact, the one I'm doing right now, I am using a table to show ages because this is an ancestor that 
probably has a 15 year range of age. And that makes a big difference when you're talking early 1800s and trying to figure out who the father could be and where they could be. So a table's great for looking at your evidence. It is. I love that table that you made for Cynthia Royston. So let's talk about those pre-1850 censuses and the tick marks. So when you're staring at that census, it doesn't seem very helpful, but when you actually take all of that information and transcribe it into a table, it can really help you understand the family and see what the family was like and give you some clues that you may miss from just reading it. So transcribing a census into a table and putting it into your analysis and your report is very helpful. So in a previous podcast, we talked about doing this and we created a cheat sheet for you about census tables that you can copy and paste into your report, kind of templates for extracting that data. So make sure that you get that from our show notes if you haven't got it already so that you can extract the information from the censuses and put it into a table. So I did this for my last Research Like a Pro study group project with William Keaton because I tracked him in several of these pre-1850 census records starting with 1790. And I used the information in this to create a hypothesis for how many children he had. And it was really helpful because when I found his estate record and it listed 13 children, I knew that it was the right family (laughs) because that's how many children Mm -hmm. I figured out that he had. Another thing that the census tables helped me to do was to figure out his birth year range. Like you mentioned before with Cynthia Royston, you can put that all into a table. So I did that as well. And he had a large range of birth years. The 1790 census, it just says that he was a free white male who was over 16 years old. So then all I had that his estimated birth year was before 1774. So it wasn't that helpful. But then using that combined with the other ranges, for example, in 1800, he was listed as age 26 to 44. So then the range was 1756 to 1774. So now I had a larger range. Anyway, I did that every year for 1810 and 1820 and was able to narrow down the years more. So make sure that you're extracting all that great data from those pre-1850 censuses and putting them into tables. And then, you know, you can try to figure out which child matches which tick mark. And you can also tell if your hypothesis would work, like George W. Dillard. So you thought that George W. Dillard was the father, and then you looked at the census where she would have been young, and there was a tick mark for a daughter of that appropriate age. So you thought, okay my hypothesis seems to be matching up. Exactly. And I also found in two censuses, the 1820 and 1830, that had her of the appropriate age. It was kind of fun because in 1830, when I put all the information into a table, I noticed that there were seven males aged 30 to 40 and five males aged 20 to 30. And the head of household was 40 to 50. That was George. I'm thinking to myself, holy cow, why does he have 12 males Mm -hmm. in the household? (laughs) That just seems so bizarre. I knew they couldn't be his sons because from the earlier households, he didn't have that many older sons. And so it was really fun because doing newspaper research in the county, I found out that he was running an inn. He was running an establishment in Columbus, Georgia for men involved in the land sales. There was a big run on the land in Alabama at this time. And he had seen this opportunity open up to have an inn, and he advertised it all the time in the paper, the local paper, talking about how he has this great inn, and it's right on the border, and it's right on the main road. And so they were probably just the boarders in the household. I doubt that they were running the actual inn because he also had five slaves. Or no, he had four male slaves and six female slaves. So they were obviously running everything there. And so these men were probably the boarders. But it's so interesting how sometimes we can just skip over information. We're looking for something so specific. And I was looking for that female that could be Cynthia and kind of just discounted those males until put it in the table. And then it was right there in front of me. And I realized, oh, okay, I haven't been thinking. And why was it helpful for you to think of the whole picture as far as putting your hypothesis that Cynthia was the daughter of George W. Dillard together with evidence about 
Cynthia's husband. Oh, good point. Because I had to figure out how she met her husband. Her husband was Thomas B. Royston. He was from Greene County, Morgan County area in Georgia, which is on the other part of the state. And here, Cynthia, well, I'm thinking it's Cynthia. Here's George W. Diller, and he's on the border of Georgia and Alabama. I'm thinking, okay, how did Thomas and Cynthia meet? I still don't have a marriage record, and I'm thinking it's because the courthouse burned in this county, probably destroyed the record. So could Thomas have been a border if George had the inn? It makes sense that Thomas coming through the area could have boarded there, and that's where he met Cynthia. He had received land in a land lottery of 1827 in the neighboring county, which puts him in a position to have come down, taken care of his land, gone to George's Inn and met Cynthia. So that's my current hypothesis. You know, I'm not 100% sure because I don't have the record putting the two of them right there together as a marriage record. And didn't you find a pretty good clue that Thomas actually did live in that area, in that exact county where the inn was? I found that he had letters left for him at the post office there in the town. So yes, that was kind of the final clinching point that, okay, he was there in the town. He was there looking at his land. This would be a good place to meet, especially if dad is has an inn and the daughter is helping in the inn. So anyway, it's been a fun project. So what else can you notice when you put things into a table and it it really helps you see the analysis? Tell us about the marriage for George W. Dillard, that second marriage that you discovered. All right. Interesting to note, make sure everyone who's listening that when you are analyzing those pre-1850 censuses every 10 years, that you keep track of how old the female is the older female, because as we know, often the women died and the men remarried. So if you have a woman who all of a sudden is 10 years younger than she was, you know, in 1820, then that's a really big clue that the first wife died in the head of household remarried younger. And that was the exact case here in 1820. The female was 26 to 45. And then in 1830, the female was 20 to 30. And she should have been, obviously, 36 to 55. There's not a column for that in 1830, but she wasn't in 30 to 40. And we do know that sometimes the tick marks could be put in the wrong slots, or maybe the man didn't know his wife's age. But in this case, it prompted me to look for a second marriage because I just wanted to know. We have to really examine these possibilities. And sure enough, I found that he had a second marriage in 1822, so two years after the 1820 census, his wife died, and he remarried a younger woman, and she is the one that shows up in 1830. We can have a lot of hypotheses about these early census records. Sometimes we're right, sometimes we're wrong, but putting it in a table helps us to look at the information. Yeah, it's just another way to visualize the information. You know, whether you like to make mind maps or tables, it's just a way to synthesize what you're seeing, and that helps your brain make connections so that you can recognize that the data that you're seeing fits with your hypothesis or doesn't. Right. So let's talk about data tables. We've talked about using tables to analyze evidence like Cynthia's age through the years. And we talked about census records, putting information in a table for censuses. But a lot of times we are researching the tax records or the land records, and we may have a lot of facts and we need to get those organized. I put each entry as I'm researching into my research log. And I like to look at it there also but sometimes it's a little bit too complicated for me with all the details. I need to put the different details into their own separate column to help me make more sense of it. And I did this when I was doing my Dillard Royston project because it centered on the land. I really, really, really had hoped that I could find a deed for George Dillard selling land to Thomas B. Royston and proving the connection between the two families. I found that for other people, for client projects, you know, where The guy is giving the land to his daughter and son-in-law for a dollar, you know, because they're family. But no such luck on this one. I had a ton of deeds that I found, and I didn't see that actual connection. So I needed to then try to figure out where the land came from. It was kind of tricky because the land records in Chambers County before 1850 were really sparse. So apparently they didn't really get many of the land deeds 
recorded until after 1850. So I needed to put this information. I had extracted tons of information from the deeds into my research log and I made up a nice table. And when I finally put it all together in the table, I was able to figure out exactly where Thomas Beverly got his land from, even though there was no deed saying where he got it from because of the land records and the table. And you can go look at it on the blog post. It's kind of a complicated table, but it helped me to make sense of everything. And I even put it into a map. I got graph paper and I drew the township map out and the land descriptions, this is a federal land state, so the land descriptions are all things like the southwest quarter of section 33, you know, you've got your township and range, and I drew it all out. And that was really fun because I actually drew the plantations. You had two separate plantations, and I figured out where all the land went. Yeah, it was really fun. It was great. I love doing land research. And a table's perfect for helping you analyze difficult things to understand. Yes. When I did my Johnson research project, I went through over a hundred land deeds in Rowan County, North Carolina that had Johnson in there as either the grantor or the grantee. And as I went through all of these land transactions, I made an enormous spreadsheet. Actually, I did a table and I put it all into the table and I put in all the witnesses. I put in the description, which had the different creeks that the land was next to and the dates and everything that might help me sort it out because there were more than one person with the name John Johnson and I needed to find the right one. And so putting it all into the table helped me organize it because I could move each row around into groupings as I found connections between the witnesses' names. So I started to notice that my John Johnson that I was researching, he had certain witnesses that were always about the same. And one of the deeds had his wife in it, and that same deed had Christopher Stokes and James Ellis and Johnson Cook as witnesses. And then there was another deed that had Christopher Stokes as the person who proved it in court. And then I started to just kind of build this cluster. And so I could put all the ones together. And then I separated out the table into separate tables. And then I named each John a different name, John Johnson of Cabin Creek, John Johnson who moved to Tennessee, and so forth. So my table was the perfect way to separate all these men of the same name after I'd gone through and extracted all of the data from the deeds. Oh, I love that. That is a fabulous example. And a lot of times I hear this from people, they just do not know what to do with these men of the same name and a table is perfect. In fact, in my advanced Southern research class last week, Over and over and over again, it was emphasized that in the South, more than any place probably, people moved as groups and everyone in that community was likely kin for some distant connection. And so we have to really keep track of those witnesses and even the neighbors. If you're really stuck in something, I have done a project before where I took maybe the 1820 census, and I made a list of all the families or head of households 10 above and 10 below the person I was researching and did that again in 1830, trying to find any individuals that seemed to be constant, that were the associates, that were people close to the ancestor researching. And so these kind of really advanced analysis types tables are your best friend for doing that. I always say that our research logs are a workhorse, but then our tables are where we take the data from our research logs and put it into a format that helps us understand it. Yeah. And help others understand it. I mean, when we're sharing it with a client or with other family members, it needs to be accessible to them. Trying to organize it in a way that's readable with column headings and adding colors if necessary and bold, just the little formatting things that make it more easy to understand. And it also helps us when we're going back to our research, because I can guarantee, you know, after we've done this research and we have it so clear in our heads, if we have not written it up and put it in tables, made it really, really clear for whether it's ourself or a client, we don't remember because then we're on to the next project and we come back and we think, oh yeah, I I know that I came to this conclusion and you have to rework the entire thing, which is super annoying. So I love that it just helps us remember and it's recorded. Well, you're going to, let's talk about actually doing the table. So everybody listening is probably thinking, okay, tables are great, but nitty gritty, how do we even make one? So Nicola, what do you do when you want to create a table? 
Well, I typically am using Google Docs because I like to be able to access my documents from whatever computer I'm using. But you can do the same thing with Microsoft Word. Google Docs and Word, they both have the table feature. So under Insert, you select Table, and then you choose the number of columns and the number of rows. And you can also add additional rows and columns after you create your table if you decide you need more, just by right-clicking on any of the cells. And you can delete columns, and you can add color schemes and styles to your table. I just like to kind of experiment and see what works best for that certain kind of table that I'm using. But like we said, we use the same census extraction tables over and over. So we have our document with all of the census tables that we can copy and paste into reports and then quickly use them. You can save a document with all of your example tables and then use them in the future. I've learned a couple tricks. Sometimes you need to resize the columns to be able to fit the text. And some columns will have a lot more text. And then like maybe at the date column will be a smaller column. And so that can be tricky trying to figure out the column width. But there is a way to easily distribute the columns so that they are all even or they work the best. And you can do that by right clicking on it and then clicking distribute columns. So I've done that a lot before and this in Google Docs. And you can also go to table properties if you right click on anywhere in the table and then go to table properties. And you can choose to have like a certain column width for every column or a minimum row height for each column. You can add padding to the cells so the text doesn't go all the way to the edge. You can align the whole table to the left or to the right or to the top. You can add different background colors to the cells and you can make the table border thicker or lighter or different color. So there's a lot of formatting options to make your table more easily to be read. A little trick in Google Docs, if you do add-ons, it's right there across the toolbar, you can add on a table formatter and then it lets you choose all sorts of really pretty colors that are already formatted for you. And so I did that a long time ago and it's great because then you can click through and say, oh, do I like it in blue? Do I like it in orange? So that's kind of fun. It's a little trick on an add-on so you can search for the table formatter. Oh, I'm adding that right now. Good tip. <laughs> yes. And then you just can have fun seeing how best your data is displayed. Sometimes, you know, you want to look very formal. You want black and white. And other times you want it to be more fun. Just because you've got a research report, you want to brighten it up. If you are working in Microsoft Word, they also have the same thing. They have lots of different designs. And one of the things that I learned, uh, I had seen this in journal articles like the NGSQ, where they would do these great tables. And then they had the source citations within the table. At the bottom of the table, they had one big cell that went all the way across and it had all the source citations instead of having them be at the bottom. And I wanted to figure out how to do that. And I thought that maybe there was like a special way to do your footnotes. And I finally asked a friend in my pro gen study group who had done a table like that. And it was so simple and so easy. And I couldn't believe I couldn't figure it out for myself. But what I did was because the formatting for footnotes don't, you know, you can do it in a table, but it still pops the footnote to the bottom of the page. So instead what you do in my table for my footnotes for my tables, instead of using like one, two, three, four, five, like my regular footnotes, I use A, B, C, D, and I put the A wherever I want the footnote to appear. Like I'm just going to give you an example. If I was doing an estimated birth years and I've got 1806, I'd put an A. And then if you're using another program, uh, you can highlight that and you can click this little X to the second power and it makes it into like a little footnote. And so I would number everything A, B, C, D. And then the very bottom, I would do a cell and I would right click on it and say merge cells. So it becomes all one big long cell instead of little broken up ones. And then that's where I put my footnote. I put A and the source citation and then B and source citation. So maybe we'll put an example of that. I'm trying to think of how better to explain that, but it was really illuminating for me to figure out how to put my source citations footnotes within a table. Yes, I love it when you do that. It really looks nice. And it's not that hard once you figure out the trick. I just didn't know all those different things you yeah, can do. Yeah, merging cells is a great 
thing to know how to do too, because I merge cells all the time. Sometimes you want the heading of a certain part of your table to be merged all the way across the row and things like that. You can get really tricky and get really good with your tables. In fact, in the study group, I've been super impressed with some of the group members who are really, really proficient with their word processing programs. And they would do these beautiful tables. It's fun to see what other people do. And I've learned from so many of them some great ideas about how to analyze this information and how to put it into a table. Always be sure, Nicole mentioned it, but I'm just going to reiterate it. Always be sure you're doing headings. And I like to do those in bold. And sometimes I put the heading in a color, fill that in with the color so it stands out. And then if I'm writing a report, I like to explain what the table is about. So in the paragraph right before the table, I'll say something like, the following table details the land records from 1850 to 1860 or something. You know, I give an introduction to the table and then I do a title for the table so that a client looking through the report, when they come to it, they don't have to read that paragraph. If they're just glancing through it, they can see right away, what is this table about? And I number my tables, you know, table one, table two, table three. You know, anything that we can do to make it just extremely clear what is going on with the information helps. Great. I think that brings this episode to an end. So thanks everybody for listening. And we hope that you will finish off your research like a pro mini challenge strong and write your report and include some tables. (laughs) Oh yeah. And go check out the blog post that I wrote about putting it in a table to get just an idea of what tables can look like and what you can do with them. So I hope everybody will try it out. Super fun to do tables. Let your creative genius run wild here. This is your chance to do something really fun and crazy with your research. (laughs) Yes, genealogy tables are very wild and crazy. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Oh, yeah. I love it. All right. Well, have a great week, everyone. We'll talk to you next time. Talk to you next time. Bye. Thank you for listening to Research Like a Pro with Diana Elder, accredited genealogy professional, and Nicole Dyer. We hope that something you heard today will help you make progress in your own genealogy research. If you like what you heard, please leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher, or visit our website, familylocket.com, to contact us. You can find our book, Research Like a Pro, A Genealogist Guide, on Amazon.com and other booksellers. We hope you'll start now to research like a pro.